Hi Rotoforge, uh, Michael here. I just wanted to let you know kind of what's going on in this video before I get started. Uh, number one, I'm going to take you through a very short introduction to what it is we're building and why. Namely, we're building a very high performance direct metal writing hot end for the Ender 3, or other 3D printers for that matter. And we are building this hot end out of a glow plug with a hole drilled in the middle inserted into the Ender 3 heatsink, basically. And the reason we're doing this is the previous approach we've been taking using additive friction extrusion deposition has turned out to be mechanically complicated and has a lot of unknowns in terms of how to actually feed such fine feedstock materials into rapidly rotating, rotating assemblies and how to get reliable printing performance from such a device. Uh, there are a few potential techniques we could use to make it happen, but the cost of the components and the assembly just kept rising as we added more parts, and the complexity of making each part work reliably was getting out of hand very quickly. So we decided to take an about face and try a different approach, using just directly heating the wire to the semi-solid state, which is between the solidus and the liquidus of the wire, and uh, using that to make materials, alloys with a relatively wide range between the solidus and the liquidus, thixotropic, in other words, pasty, make them flowable, so that we can actually print with them like you would with clay or chocolate or food, other foods. And so that's essentially what this video is about. Uh, what we're making, how we're making it, and, uh, well, why we're making it and how we're making it. And maybe a few caveats along the way towards the end of the video. So, with no further ado, I'll get right into the what it is we're making and the why. So, as you can see here, the ceramic body of the glow plug has a conductive ceramic inner core and an outer ceramic conductor. The outer conductor conducts through the body of the glow plug, the fat section, and the ceramic core is connected to a tapered region at the back that is buried in the glow plug that connects the top contact. At the very end, we see there's a resistor ceramic cap that connects the inner and outer conductors, which acts as the primary heat generator in the glow plug. The inner and outer conductors are separated by a silicon nitride insulating layer, as is the outside from the outer conductor. Whenever current runs through this heating element, it generates heat from ohmic losses, and exactly at the tip where the resistance is the highest is where most of the heat is generated. This is very desirable, because it provides a high heat density source for us to push wire through once we've EDM drilled a hole in the glow plug, and this is exactly what we want to do, so that we can build a hot end that fits on the Ender 3 and allows us to feed and print metal directly from metal wire and ceramic directly from ceramic fibers. So why is it we want to build a hot end like this anyways? Well, conventional hot ends, like the E3D hot block, are large and heavy, and if you do the math, they have about 4,000 cubic millimeters of metal, which is a lot of metal to heat and cool, and they have a lot of surface area through which they lose heat to convection. This makes overall for a very slow heat and cool cycle. If you then add a nozzle to this hot block, even more mass and even more volume, <clears throat> as well as a conductive loss path, which is not a heat source itself, to the surface of the build plate, well, this is a recipe for disaster if you start trying to print materials at high temperatures or that have very narrow windows at which they're thixotropic. So here you can see a simulation of a typical hot end and the nozzle close to a build plate at a high temperature. There's a very steep thermal gradient that gets established between the hot nozzle and hot block and the build plate. Now, most metals have narrow windows. Bronze is an exception. It has a relatively wide 150 degree C window, 130 degree C window between its solid and liquid state, which gives it a wide thixotropic region. However, for a material that is eutectic or near eutectic, it has a well-defined melting point, typically no more than five degrees C wide, where it is, quote, thixotropic or at least semi-liquid. A pure metal, however, has a well-defined melting point and an exact temperature, and these require extremely high power densities and extremely fast thermal cycle rates to be able to keep up with these phase transitions. So I did a quick experiment. I used a glow plug to try and forge weld aluminum wire to an aluminum oxide surface on an aluminum build plate. And here you can see that I have some success semi-solid forming this aluminum wire to its own blobs and to the aluminum oxide itself. And the fact that I could do this with just a DC power supply and no special closed loop control, mostly by hand, was very encouraging for doing more work on these glow plugs as hot ends. And then I also tried forge welding bronze 510 phosphor 510 bronze to a glass, borosilicate glass plate, just to prove to myself that we could get the temperature necessary and we could actually make a reasonable connection between the bronze and the glass. 
and so began a six-month odyssey of figuring out how to drill a center bore hole through the entire length of the core ceramic conductor of these glow plugs in order to be able to fully test whether they have the necessary power density, the necessary temperature response time, and the appropriate location of maximum power density to facilitate direct deposition, that is, direct right of molten or semi-molten metals and glasses and ceramics on the Ender-3. And here is the process by which we actually figured out how to make these glow plug hot ends in a way that would satisfy our engineering requirements. So this process begins with using a rotary tool and a silicon carbide wheel to remove the top electrode at the plastic insulating nut of the glow plug. <clears throat> we then take the glow plug and insert it into our lathe so that we can machine the glow plug body down from 8.1 millimeter diameter to 7 millimeter outside diameter, uh, 48 millimeters from the ceramic tip, or about 16 millimeters from where the thick section becomes thin on the glow plug. Here you can see I'm mechanically marking that manually before I actually do the machining operation. Um, we're doing this so that we can ensure a snug fit to the heatsink and a smooth surface finish to provide good thermal and electrical contact between the glow plug outer body electrode and the heatsink of the Ender 3. So, once we've done this machining operation and checked that the tolerances are correct by sliding the heatsink over it and ensure that there is a snug fit, as you see here. We can then take the glow plug and flip it in the lathe and use a one millimeter parting tool to remove the excess glow plug body material and expose the center electrode telescope, basically a long piece of metal that uh, connects the tip, the rear tip of the ceramic, the center core of the ceramic conductor to the top electrode. And we have to do this very gently in order to, about 10 millimeters from where we made the cut in the body, to, not, to ensure we do not break the ceramic top electrode and to ensure that we have a nice smooth interface that can be soldered to and that will allow easy passage of the wire without any step discontinuities whenever this is turned into a hot end. <clears throat> so once you make this cut, a few important things to note. There's a hollow hole in the top of the central electrode where we cut it off. Um, that hollow hole um, basically allows the electrode in the EDM process to pass straight through the ceramic glow plug and will allow a wire to pass through once we use it as a hot end. And we go ahead and check whether the uh, top of the glow plug contact actually makes it past the uh, ridge in the heat sink where the pneumatic fitting usually bottoms out. So once we've done all that, we go ahead and throw the glow plug into 99% IPA to remove the machining oil and machining grease. <clears throat> we'll then uh, clamp and gently sand the top electrode with 150 grit sandpaper uh, to prep it for soldering. And this is just to ensure that the surface has uh, exposed clean metal and a nice uh, low contact angle between the solder and the zinc chloride flux we're going to use um, just to ensure good joint quality and we get uh, convenient wetting conditions between the solder and the stainless steel top contact. <clears throat> so now that we've done that, we're going to go ahead and crimp some 16 and 20 gauge ring terminations to an XT30 connector and then we pre tin one of the ring terminals to avoid difficulties soldering to the top contact in the heat sink later and to just ensure that we uh, can make this top contact of the glow plug and the ring terminal uh, bond intimately uh, whenever we go to install the parts in the heatsink. <clears throat> and you can just see me doing that pre tinning operation in the ring terminal here. And you can also see here to the right the ruby fluid uh, zinc chloride flux that we're going to use to remove the oxide of the stainless and ensure a good bond between the solder and the uh, top contact, the glow plug. So we use about a half a milliliter of zinc chloride ruby fluid to flux the glow plug top contact, pre-tin the iron, and we touch this pre-tinned iron to the top of the glow plug contact, and then apply a little bit of flux until we can see wetting between the solder and the stainless steel top contact. Um, this allows us to ensure that the amount of solder glob on the contact is not too large and that we have a good uh, metallurgical bond between the solder and the stainless. Then we check to make sure the ring terminal uh, fits over the glow plug top contact 
and the contacts not over blobbed or bridged to the glow plug body. And then we check the heatsink and we machine a six millimeter wide by 10 millimeter deep slot for the ring electrode to fit into in the heatsink. We do this in order to ensure that the ring electrode can be mechanically supported by the heatsink and that the heatsink does not get in the way of any electrical connection between the ring terminal and the top contact. <clears throat> Now we clean the gap between the top contact and the glow plug body with a razor blade to remove any burrs or shorted material that might be there. And then we ensure that the glow plug top contact uh, solder does not graze the machined heat sink or hit any burrs or chips or anything that might have been left over from machining. We then wrap the pretend ring electrode in Kapton tape to provide isolation and strain relief to the contact once it's soldered into the heat sink on the glow plug top contact. And then we slather silicone inside the top of the heatsink to insulate any sharp edges, to blunt any sharp edges, and to electrically insulate the top contact and top contact ring. We then put a silicone O-ring to provide mechanical support and electrical insulation and thermal conductivity during soldering. This allows us to press the insulated ring terminal onto the top contact over silicone over the silicone O-ring and with the iron, and we make sure not to lever on the glow plug top contact when we're doing this. This facilitates a good uh, electronic bond that is mechanically supported and not likely to break later. And we just do this until the solder reflows between the top contact and the ring terminal. We then pull on it and wiggle it a little bit just to make sure that the uh, contact is sound and that the terminal does not wiggle or bend or shake. <clears throat> and then we use an M the same M10 pneumatic fitting with a thread cut to 3 millimeter length that came with the Ender 3 heatsink stock to sandwich another silicone O-ring between fitting between the fitting and the glow plug top contact ring terminal for mechanical support, electrical isolation, and heat dissipation. <clears throat> we then include a 2 millimeter OD by 0.8 millimeter ID PTFE tube inside the Bowden in the pneumatic fitting just to make sure that we get good alignment for the wire path down into the ceramic glow plug whenever we EDM it. And then we replace the stock set screw with an M3 by 6 stainless steel screw and nut to provide contact with the heatsink and the glow plug body for the other electrode. This is to complete the hot end circuit, basically. It's important to keep the wires away from the glow plug tip and make sure the glow plug resistance is within 0.3 to 0.5 ohms to ensure that there's no damage from the previous processing. We then bake it 95C for two hours to cure silicone and degrease. The work holding is made of 3D printed PLA, 15% infill, and has holes for oil weep and glow plug drilling alignment, as well as electrodes to slide in and out of the, des of the design. It's designed to work with a milling vise from Carbide Nomad and holds a 0.5mm jewel bearing that acts as the EDM electrode guide in the top of the work holding. This keeps it centered, the whole electrode and glow plug assembly centered and concentric, and facilitates easy alignment before you do the actual EDM drilling. This also allows you to use the glow plug's top contact as the EDM red wire electrode contact. And so basically, you don't short through the rest of the ceramic body of the glow plug. The EDM drill system uses a Graco Magnum 3000 PSI airless paint sprayer for oil supply to the drill spindle, as seen in Ben Krasnow's video on applied science. Um, connect, connecting the pump to the drill spindle, is a custom fitting courtesy of our local tractor supply shop, Poor Man's Tractor Supply. The drill spindle is detailed by Applied Science, but has an M12 by 1.25 male thread on top that had to be adapted to an MPSM pipe thread on the paint sprayer's end effector. Um, the drill spindle also provides mount points for the spindle motor, which rotates the electrode at a steady 240 RPM or so, given our particular setup you see here. It also provides support for a carbon brush to connect the pulse generator, the EDM pulse generator, to the brass electrode through the three-jaw chuck. And of course, a three-jaw chuck mounts on this drill spindle to provide positive mechanical rotation drive and electrical connection for the EDM pulse power supply through a carbon brush to the brass electrode. This uh, three-jaw chuck needs to be regularly cleaned in operation during the EDM drilling process, and it needs to be tightened securely around the brass electrode until you get about a 6-ohm contact resistance during the drilling operation. The drill rig itself <clears throat> is built on a series of 1x2 and 1x3 <clears throat> aluminum extrusion base and supports to hold and align the 
carbide milling vise and support the HEMA NEMA 23 stepper motor and one meter ball screw stage as it drives the spindle down into the work as you drill at about seven to 10 millimeters per minute. The whole rig sits in a two foot by three foot oil pan that I purchased from Amazon. <clears throat> and the oil reservoir for the McMaster EDM oil is basically just a polypropylene box I purchased from Walmart. The pan acts as a sluice for the cut debris during the EDM drilling process and helps to extend oil life by keeping more of that carbon and excess material uh, basically in the pan rather than in the oil. <clears throat> and you can see that it sort of scatters here. The pulse generator itself is Rack Robotics Power Core V1. It's a nice piece of open source hardware. It puts out two kilohertz to 72 volts and the Rack Robotics team is very helpful and responsive. I highly recommend this power supply. Ender 3 is what we're using to provide Z-axis control from the Z-stepper driver. Uh, it's driven by project base. We also have our big red vent hose here, which sucks EDM fumes out the window and keeps them away from our lungs and away from our hose. <clears throat> the EDM process itself starts by inserting the electrode into the electrode guide uh, with a one millimeter gap between the electrode tip and the glow plug tip. We then also sand the glow plug tip gently with 150 grit sandpaper, and we start the vent fan to make sure fumes go out. We also activate the electrode rotation, and then we activate the full pressure 3000 PSI oil flow through the drill spindle and through the electrode. We then use Pronter Face to drive the Ender 3Z axis and drive at a constant speed the drill spindle into the work, plunging at about 10 millimeters per minute. We then turn on the pulse generator before we start plunging, and we wait until we see oil coming out of the base of the work holding, basically. And we periodically clean the drill spindle to make sure that no carbon builds up on the uh, end of the, or no carbon builds up and causes a short or a break in the circuit between the three jaw and the electrode. <clears throat> and at the very end of the drilling operation, you're likely to see some shorting to the top electrode contact. Uh, don't try to avoid that by making sure the alignment is very accurate. And if it does occur, um, try not to wall out the hole. Basically be ready to turn the power supply off in the event that this occurs. It can destroy your work. So then we check the resistance of the glow plug. It typically shifts by 0.01 to 0.03 ohms after drilling, and once all the carbon from the EDM process has been removed. And we clean the hole by pulling some wire through the drilled hole cold in order to kind of grind out any excess carbon, and then we burn out the carbon by running the, the glow plug at an elevated temperature for a while, typically 900 to 1,000 C for about 30 seconds. And then we check for continuity by heating up the plug on a DC power supply just to ensure that it is still working after we've drilled it. And every now and then you get a little bit of a step discontinuity between the drilled hole and top contact electrode. And sometimes the alignment has a big effect on whether or not your drill operation is successful or whether or not you're able to actually uh, feed material through it smoothly. So just things to look out for. <clears throat> Typically, uh, the as-drilled resistance should be between about 0.32 and about 0.52 ohms. So here's me testing the actual glow plug using a DC power supply, heating it up to about 1,000 degrees Celsius. This one is slathered with uh, some furnace cement to insulate it for a future thermocouple application. <clears throat> and there you go. That's pretty much how we went about making the EDM drilled glow plug hot ends. And there it is turning on. We hope to be able to follow this up with some actual printing footage very soon. Thanks for watching. So, uh, that was a lot of work, but here we are at the end of the video, and I just wanted to include a few quick notes on safety, particularly. Um, the lead tin solder we're using is lead containing, so if you decide to use the same kind of solder, be aware of that, use adequate ventilation, don't expose yourself to too much in rosin fumes or any lead, or any heavy metals for that matter. Um, zinc chloride flux is relatively poisonous. Zinc is pretty bioactive and can be readily vaporized because there's a very high vapor pressure and a low melting point. And zinc chloride in particular makes HCl fumes and the zinc itself is very fine, um, basically atomized zinc. And it, when it vaporizes in the flux, it can be inhaled and it's important to use adequate ventilation when using zinc chloride flux on any material. Um, EDM, the electric discharge machining process we're using, has a tendency to use high pressures, which can produce hydraulic injection injuries and can produce fine mists of oil spray that contain a variety of uh, VOCs and other undesirable materials. And the cuts were from cutting the glow plug may contain heavy metals or a variety of other uh, somewhat toxic materials. So if you do decide to replicate what we've done, 
just be aware of those things and be sure to use adequate ventilation. Do it in a proper shop, preferably not in a one bedroom apartment like we are doing. Um, and be sure to wear gloves when handling anything oily or coated with zinc chloride flux or otherwise toxic. And just be safe. You know, don't, don't expose yourself to unnecessary levels of VOCs or heavy metals or other dangerous compounds. And uh, <laughs> beware of electric shock when handling high voltages like with an EDM machine or high frequency pulse power supplies for that matter. And uh, don't burn yourself on a hot end that works at 1300 degrees Celsius. You know, maybe don't touch the bright, white, glowy thing. Um, just some things to think about. There are probably a few others in here, but I don't want to be held liable for any people trying to replicate us, getting themselves hurt or burning their houses down. This is pretty dangerous, and I'm not going to say we exactly know what we're doing, but I am more than willing to explore dangerous unknowns in order to try and find a solution to this problem. It, weighs very heavily on me all the time. Um, but besides that, there are a few caveats to the process that I kind of wanted to highlight while I'm here. Um, when you're actually doing the EDM drilling process, uh, it's important to remember that the ceramic is easier to drill than the metal in the glow plug. And so if the top contact of the glow plug has a step discontinuity or something in it, uh, the metal part of the, step, step of the top contact has a discontinuity, it may interact with the electrode in the EDM machine and that can cause the electrode to buckle or to short against that metal because the metal doesn't cut the same way the ceramic does and that can be very confusing and very frustrating and it can cause the electrode to buckle and when it buckles it will sometimes short against the side of the ceramic tip of the glow plug that you've drilled in through because the hole is so deep and that will knock a hole basically cause an arc that blows a hole in the ceramic or in the electrode itself and the high pressure from the pump causes the oil to spray everywhere. So if you're setting this up, make sure to use some kind of a spray guard or an enclosure, preferably put it somewhere away from you while it's running and make it more automated than we have, um, just to ensure that that doesn't happen. And preferably, you know, make sure that the work alignment is very good so that the electrode will basically slide through the assembly without interacting with any of those metal parts, um, because that would just this also ruins your work in addition to potentially ruining your health if it happens frequently. So, you know, it's important to make sure that everything is very well aligned. Maybe if you have it, an XY stage to align the work, the work holding, the glow plug and the work holding more reliably would be very helpful. There are quite a few other improvements like using actual uh, PEC control. So, you know, whenever the EDM machine detects a short via current detection or current sensing, um, it, it could back up automatically and then proceed with plunging again. We haven't implemented that yet because it's a bit interesting. It's not complicated to implement, but doing it well takes time. Um, and I, that's just not been a focus. Um, the machining process, we used a lathe, uh, but we actually started out using uh, just the rotary tool. It's entirely possible to make the glow plugs, to pre-process the glow plugs completely ready for EDM machining with just a rotary tool and a lot of sanding and a lot of patience. Um, it takes a lot of time, kind of a pain in the butt, but if a rotary tool is all you got, it'll do the job. And I can totally publish that video elsewhere if there's interest in it. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, as far as the milling operation goes, um, it's important to make sure that you don't make the slot too wide. Uh, because the slot in the heatsink, the Ender 3 heatsink, provides lateral support to the ring terminal. And that helps prevent the top contact of the electrode from breaking off, or the top contact of the glow plug from breaking off once it's drilled and inserted in the heatsink. Um, these glow plugs, once they're drilled, uh, become very fragile, particularly the top contact, because the EDM process does thermal shock the ceramic and it creates a lot of micro cracks. So ideally, you would anneal the entire glow plug at up to like 1200 degrees C for about an hour in order to sort of heal those cracks, but we don't really have that capability here. Um, and we just kind of deal with them as they are. So we're actually looking for alternative approaches to building these hot ends that are that don't require extreme deep pole EDM drilling. Um, you know, 100 to 20 to 1 aspect ratio in ultra refractory ceramic is not an easy thing to do. Um, but yeah, so we're looking for alternative approaches. Uh, we'll probably be publishing a video on those in a few weeks if things work out well. Um, and we're, we're probably, we're also still figuring out how to attach a temperature sensor. The glow plugs themselves form a nice uh, insulating oxy nitride layer on the surface. Um, 
just natively whenever heat when they're whenever they're heated up. But the oxynitride is not sufficiently insulating to shield a thermocouple from the electric fields driving the glow plug. So we're still looking for ways to, in a very lightweight, compact fashion, provide temperature sensing besides just using the current flowing through the glow plug. Um, we want to be able to probably implement a thermocouple with an amplifier board like a MAX 31655 or 30... I'll have to put a link in the description, but typical sort of 1200 plus degree C type K thermocouples. Um, just because they have the most support and they're kind of the most straightforward, even though they're a bit finicky. A uh, high temperature thermistor would be great if such a thing existed, um, but it seems like the last one was made by Vichet and has gone out of supply about six years ago. Um, you know, like 950C thermistor. Who knew? Um, yeah, yeah, so I don't think there's anything else. Uh, if you've gotten this far in the video, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll probably have some printing footage here pretty soon. Uh, if things go well. Research projects never work out exactly as planned, so we'll have to see. Uh, just leave any comments or you know, criticism or interesting thoughts you have maybe in the comments below. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe. So, yeah. Oh, and I have links to all the Villa materials, uh, the EDM machine parts that we used, the lathe we used, and the glow plugs themselves in the description if you're interested in doing this or attempting it yourself. Um, you might be able to find a better way to do it, but I am just leaving documentation of how I've done it so that others might be able to follow up if they felt like it. So yeah, thanks a lot and uh, have a great day.